Welcome to Behavioral Grooves. My name is Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. We are building a community of people who want to learn about the application of behavioral science to work and life. We do this through having discussions with interesting and insightful guests that always turn out to be quite fun. Always? Yeah, pretty much always. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. And in this episode, we spoke with Robert Cialdini, New York Times bestselling author, beloved professor, and world-class researcher. In our Top 10 Books podcast, we listed his book, Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion, as one of the classics in behavioral science. It has sold over 3 million copies since it was first introduced in 1984. Yeah, that, that's a lot of books. It is a lot of books, and <laughs> rightfully so. It is a classic and is just a gem of a book. And mo his most recent book, Presuasion, is actually one of my all-time favorites as well, probably because it gets into components of priming and how those primes can influence our actions even if we don't know it. Did you say primes? I did say primes. Can you say socks? <laughs> Bob started our discussion in this episode by sharing his most underappreciated research, which was really cool. It's a study that uses littering as a way to predict, before the polls close, the outcome of an election by watching how voters treated flyers left on their cars from each political party. It required no surveys. It's pure observation of behaviors. And the question was, did the voters throw away the flyers that were put on their cars, or did they keep them? And you'll have to listen to the podcast to find out. Ooh. Bob then shared some insights from a line of research that he'd investigated for over a decade. The motivations for pro-social behavior, such as giving to a person who is begging on the street or in need. Bob revealed that there are many motivations at play, but that the satisfaction of the ego is one of those primary drivers. While many of us believe that being charitable might be an obligation for those who are doing well or is this altruistic component that is built into us, his thoughtful research revealed that egoism, that selfish desire to feel good about ourselves, is really at the heart of helping others. He went on to say that helping others is more likely to occur when the person in need appears to be in group or in tribe. Oh, so what the person is wearing helps us determine whether or not that person is like us or in tribe. No. <laughs> so that means, are you ready for this? That means that the clothes you wear could determine whether or not someone's going to help you. So being in Minnesota, I probably shouldn't be wearing my Packer jersey because if I get in a car accident, there are people going to just pass me by? Is that? We have a winner. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Ah, oh, that's just uh, careful. It, careful what you wear. Careful. I'm going to have to, you know, think about my my clothing choice a lot more now. Well, this episode of Behavioral Grooves is brought to you by Creative Group Inc. We have worked with CGI, and we find that their process of co-creating your incentive and engagement programs provides you with a more robust solution because it's co-created. It reflects the real realities of your organization. Yeah, they share our belief that incentives and rewards shouldn't be used to create brand mercenaries. Instead, they should be about creating brand missionaries. So CGI works with companies to create science-backed design strategies that leverage proprietary methodologies and technologies to drive engagement and results. So, Tim, that seems like a lot of corporate speak. Boil that well, down. Well, it is. It is a bunch of corporate speak, but the bottom line is you should check them out. And we're going to have links to the creative group in our show notes, so strongly encourage you to check them out. Yeah, fantastic. They are a very good organization and uh, encourage you to see what they do. So, Without further ado, sit up and pay attention. Yes. Don't sit back with a drink. Well, you could do that too, but sit up and pay attention with that drink <laughs> and listen to this fascinating, insightful, and truly fun discussion with Bob Cialdini. Welcome to the Behavioral Groups Podcast, Bob. Thanks. <laughs> I'm glad to be with you and your followers. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, thank you. So uh, we want to start with a speed round. So which do you prefer, living near the sea or living in the desert? Well, I spent uh, 
sabbaticals near the sea in Santa Cruz, California, in La Jolla, California, in uh, uh, in Northern California as well. Um, and of course, I, I live in the desert in Phoenix. And I would say I prefer the desert except in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like Minnesota except in the winter for everybody that lives here, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. So is littering a political statement or are people just lazy? It comes from some research that you might have done. Yeah. It's, it's research that I've done and that, in fact, I believe is the most underreported and underappreciated uh, of, my, of the studies I've done. So um, I can answer that uh, right now. Um, it's a political statement. And if on the front of the flyer is the name of a candidate you prefer or candidate you don't prefer. All right. We were able to, to predict before the polls closed the outcome of the election. It was a presidential election at four, at excuse me, nine separate polling stations. Okay. By just putting a flyer on the windshield of people who had parked in the in the lot and gone in to vote, <laughs> half of them were for the Democrat, half were for the Republican. And then we counted whether they threw the flyer on the ground when they came out and uh, took it off their windshield or kept it with them. Right? And we just took the reciprocal of the amount of each candidate that was on the ground. The more flyers of a particular candidate that were on the ground, the more likely that candidate was going to win the election in that polling place. We had nine polling places and we predicted it nine times. Wow. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so what people keep with them or divest from themselves determines how they feel about this entity, right? And so uh, we published that. We're very proud of it, how we were, be, without even asking, uh, you know, at, when people were coming out, these, these exit polls that sometimes get it all wrong, we got it right nine out of nine times just by looking at whether they, <laughs> they littered or kept a flyer with the candidate they had just voted for. Voted. That is such a, it's such a, simple yet really insightful way of kind of judging people's uh, reactions to that. That is fascinating. You know, so. we didn't do the follow-up research, but we were thinking of, I wonder if we could judge with what force they threw the, <laughs> <laughs> the rival's uh, flyer to the ground to see how much <laughs> the uh, that candidate uh, lost the election in, in oh that particular poll. Uh, uh, right. Uh, but it seems you could do it with all kinds of things besides candidates. You could do it with products. You could do it with political uh, positions. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, of one sort or another, uh, are, are this, con this country's uh, approach to the Middle East. Yeah. We could get all kinds of opinions that didn't, that weren't influenced by social, um, uh, social enhancement concerns, yeah. where they weren't thinking of, well, what are you going to think of me if I say I like this candidate or I don't like this candidate and so on? Get all of that effect out of there uh, because they didn't know we were looking at their littering behavior. We, yeah. were, we weren't even in the, their in their line of sight. We were <laughs> hidden. We just looked at whether the flyer hit the ground. You look at the ground after they, right, they, after they drove away. Right? <laughs> oh, man, that is fascinating. I, I love it. Okay, so you've written a lot about helping behaviors. And, and the question has been egoism versus altruism. Yeah. So, so my, my, my point of view is egoism. That is, people help in, or, 
not simply to enhance the welfare of others, but in the, in the process of enhancing the welfare of others, they feel good about the process, right? Mm -hmm. It lifts their spirits. Um, and especially if they see that other as in a, a group with them, some, somebody that they uh, share an identity with, for example. Right. Right. So, for example, there was research showing that uh, if you see somebody who has who needs help, has tripped and fallen by the side of the road. Right. This was a study done in um, in UK and he's wearing a soccer team sweatshirt <laughs> that you support you are significantly more likely to help him <laughs> wow. because he is of you. He is one of you. Yeah. Right? So there are, there are reasons for helping. Now, this is, I get criticized for taking this view that we are not inherently, a, a, uh, let me say that differently, that inherently we are not likely to perform purely altruistic actions right right we we need some sort of sense of we feel good about that in order to make that happen and we have research to suggest that but here's what i claim that's an ennobling feature of our species that somebody in ethiopia or somebody who's just experienced the uh, the tsunami in indonesia we would f we are willing to help those people from afar right because it makes us feel good so we've we've developed uh, a tendency within our species that allows us to distribute aid to people who are in need just because they are in need and we know that we feel better about ourselves as a consequence. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a commercial out right now. I don't know if you've seen it that has a uh, going up in an elevator and there's a Patriots um, guy wearing a Patriots jersey and then another person wearing an Eagles jersey and one is carrying all this stuff and he asks, can you press, you know, eight yeah. for me? And then yeah. the guy gets out and he leaves and he presses all the buttons up. Ah. And <laughs> and so I'm wondering yeah. if, he, you know, that, that opposite effect actually works so that yeah, you're, you're less, you know, you're, you're actually evil towards somebody because of wearing the opposite. <laughs> if, they are, if they are truly a rival, uh, yeah, that's, I think, that's uh, evolved yeah not to want to enhance the welfare of competitors whose genetic makeup is different from our, ours we want to advance copies of our own genes yeah. into the future not somebody else's so to the extent that we have these tribes mm-hmm these days, right? E even mm -hmm. in politics, right? Oh, yeah. so, uh, different uh, political identities, different religious identities, different national identities. Um, it, it, it requires that we somehow see unity among us, even within the differences, yeah. to transcend that rivalry. And I'll give you an example from that study that was done of uh, soccer fans. Right? Okay. So if instead of having – so in one study, if you had a, um, a T-shirt on, a sweatshirt on that fit with your preferred team, you were significantly more likely to help than if you had a, a rival's uh, – sweatshirt on but they found that if the guy on the ground just had a soccer sweatshirt on one that said i love soccer this guy got help <laughs> because he was in the larger category larger tribe. of soccer lovers 
This is a way we can think about a transcending some of the tribalism, pointing to the commonality, the overarching commonalities that we share. Wow. Yeah. Oh, God. That's, and wouldn't it be great if, if our, in, in the United States, uh, we had a little more focus on our larger commonalities rather than our petty differences? Yes. And I think, you know, we, we, we can do it because we have a unique um, national identity. The, the, the way that the Constitution and the, the, um, the society has been set up is really unlike any other country. Mm-hmm. And if we point to those unique features, they are unique to us, um, though that can lead to that sense of overarching unity uh, that can bring us together. Uh, it's, it's difficult, but um, I think that's the, that's the direction we can take. Yeah. So, Bob, we'd like to ask you, so you've done a ton of research. We, we're looking at 200 plus published articles out there and various different things, and you've been doing this for a while now. But what are some of the new things that you're working on and what, what are, what's exciting you now? What, what's, what are you working on? Well, the newest research that we've done, uh, it really does have me feeling enthusiastic uh, about the research process. Um, and it is, it's an answer to a question I frequently get, you know, I do uh, public speaking now, uh, yep. sort of on platforms at conferences and conventions. And I'll talk about the six principles of influence. Many audience members are familiar with them, and somebody will raise a hand at the end of the, the, the session, the Q&A period, and say, you know this principle of social proof that you talk about? Uh, the one that says uh, people want to follow the lead of multiple comparable others. If they see that many others like them are moving in a particular direction, that reduces their uncertainty about what they should do there. If all of my friends are raving about a new restaurant uh, or a new film uh, or a new piece of software, that's they've beta tested this for me. That's That's a great shortcut for me to say, oh, that would be worth my purchase, you know, in that direction, uh, and I'll probably be right, right? So that's the principle of social, if a lot of other people are doing it. And so there's research to show that if you describe yourself as the fastest, or the, or excuse me, the, the, the largest selling, or the top, uh, uh, the, the, the one that has the best reviews on Amazon, um, or uh, the uh, the most popular product in your category, these kinds of things. That causes people to be more willing to move in that direction, right? And but that hand comes up in my class, in 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 my courses. Excuse me, in my my speeches. And um, the questioner says, "But what if you don't have <laughs> social proof in your on your side? What if you're a startup?" <laughs> what if you've got a great new product, but it doesn't have market share yet to speak of? It's it it couldn't compete in terms of popularity with the the best selling product. What do I do then? Mm-hmm. And my answer always used to be, "Well, use one of the other six, one of the other <laughs> principles. <laughs> use the other principle. Hey." Use scarcity, or use authority, <laughs> or use you know you're not you're not limited to this one. That was all. People nodded, but I could tell they weren't completely uh, satisfied by that answer. Uh, and now I think I might have another answer for them. Great. That, that allows the startup, the people who aren't yet at the market share level where they can crow about it, to get people to move in their direction by using social proof that they don't even have yet. It is to tell them about the trend in adoption of their product or service to that point. So if you have only 15% of the market share, 
right? Saying we have 15% is deadly. It tells people to go somewhere else. Most people don't choose you. But if you say, three years ago, we had 5%. Two years ago, we had 10%. Last year, we have 15%. All of a sudden now, you see a growing trend in your direction. Um, there's something in the psych, uh, in Gestalt psychology called the principle of continuation. Okay. It says that when people see three data points in some kind of linear progression, right? Whatever that progression is, how steep it is, and so on, they assume that the next data point will be a linear continuation of that trajectory. And the one after that, a linear continuation of the next, of, of the previous one. Okay, so, so here's how we tested this idea. Um, in uh, in a, a college uh, sample, we invited subjects to come in and participate in two separate experiments, they were told. The first one, they were to rate some newspaper articles right, that we asked them to read about water conservation. Okay. And one of those articles just described uh, the need for water conservation conservation given the impending peril of uh, of water shortages uh, around the world right? so they read those articles right? that's that was the control group they just read about water conservation yeah okay. then we had another group that said that heard at the end of the articles only 30% of homeowners in your area actually do try to conserve water in their homes, right? Okay. That was the typical social proof, but uh, reverse social proof. It means they can do the math. It means 70% don't, right? Right. Okay. And then we had a third group at the end of reading their articles. They said, Three years ago, 20% of people tried to conserve water in the home. Two years ago, it was 25. This year, it's 30. All right? Okay. Okay. And so then they just rated these articles on various kinds of literary things. That was uh, just uh, a a distraction. We said, okay, now it's time for the next experiment. It's actually a consumer products test experiment. There's a new toothpaste that is coming out on the market. And the manufacturers have asked us to to have our college student subjects test this new (laughs) toothpaste and see how much they like it. So everybody got a toothbrush with a line of this new toothpaste in it and we're ushered to a sink okay we left the room and we said please brush your teeth and then rate this product and we measured how much water they used in brushing their teeth we had a basin at the bottom of the sink that they couldn't see and we just weighed the basin right (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and here's what we found. Compared to the control who just learned about water condition uh, um, uh, conservation, those who heard that only 30% were using, um, were, were, were conserving in the home, they used more water than the control group. Used more than the control. Right. They wow. learned so that people the- don't care about this. Because it was the reverse. They, they they did the math in their head. 30%. Well, that means 70% don't care. That's the that's my cue. That's, that's my, my cue. That's what, how I decide what to do. What are the people around me like me doing? But 
those who got the trend to 30% use significantly less water wow. in brushing their teeth. Even though in those other articles, we never mention brushing your teeth. No. It was just the idea of water conservation that had now been seen in their eyes as the coming norm. It wasn't the norm. It was the coming norm, the norm of the future. Right? right. And in fact, when we did an analysis and we had asked these uh, individuals questions about what, what percentage of people do you think in the future will conserve water in the home? That was the question that mediated our results. That is, those people who saw the future norm as, uh, as conservation were the ones who then brushed their teeth the, less, the least. Right? So, so the application of this, again, for a new startup or somebody mm -hmm. who's, you know, maybe a, a, a new podcast, right? And right. getting out there, you're looking at this and you're, you're trying to get that envision what the future can be right. That's right. Of, of that positive. That, that is really fascinating. And I love the research. Well, so, so, I mean, the point is you still get to use social proof, mm -hmm. but right. it's not the social proof of the present, it's the social proof of the future. People want to be ahead of the trend, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Every, oh. you, you don't want to be left behind. Right. Right. So what's the trend? What are the people around me like me doing? What are they likely to be doing in the future? So um, I now get to answer that question at my <laughs> Uh, and they raise their hand when somebody raises, and they always raise their hand with that question. Do you, do you need to have those three points? Do you think, or can it be that the trend is rising? Is it, or have you even looked at that? The, at you have to have a minimum of three points. Okay. Otherwise, it's just uh, inconsistency. You can't okay. really say uh, with with confidence that there's a, a tra trajectory. Yeah, it reminds me of some of the work that George Lowenstein has done on just uh, sequencing and progress and kind of the, even the yeah. progress principle from yeah. um, what I can't remember her name, uh, you know, but, the, but that we like to see progress and showing that right. progress is a motivational component probably ties in somewhere underneath all of that. And uh, Yeah, you know. I mean, I know, for example, uh, if my favorite team wins a game by coming back at the end. Yeah. I feel so much better about them and their prospects, right? Then if they win that game with a lot of scores at the beginning and then stay flat <laughs> and just hold off the opposition. Yeah. Right? That's a that there's no progress there that I can think will be uh, a harbinger of the future. Yeah, bringing in that future yeah. state or that future norm, as you mentioned before. Yeah. yeah. Well, good. So you're you're working on a major rewrite of influence. Correct. So tell us about that. What you you you're you're bringing this up to date into the the current, uh, as you say, sort of a more contemporary view. Right. Tell our listeners a little bit about about what's in store and and how far out in the future we might be from from seeing that major rework of influence. Two major changes um, that I think reflect uh, what you just said is is how this is going to be uh, different in fundamental ways from what earlier editions uh, provided. the The first is uh, the role of of elect electronic media uh -huh. mm -hmm. in sending persuasive messages as being the, the the substrate being the the platform in which we send and receive persuasive appeals what what are the what's the role of of those media and do we find a place 
for the principles of influence in spurring desirable change in audiences with those kinds of uh, channels. And uh, so one of the things I'm doing with uh, the new edition of Influence is to, to talk about uh, uh, the internet and what it's done to the process of moving people in our direction. Uh, and, and so uh, I do that throughout, but I also have a new feature, what I, as I call, what I call e-boxes, where I will take s screen grabs of various kinds of online sites, uh, they can, uh, of, of one sort or another, right? and show how they are using each of the principles, right? <laughs> You know, when when um, Airbnb says um, nine other people have looked at this uh, product uh, or this this opportunity, right? Yeah. In the last hour, whoa! All of a sudden, yeah. there's a combination of scarcity and social proof going on. Right? Yeah. Right. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, th those uh, same thing with review sites and uh, uh, yeah. how many stars and how many reviews and so on. And, and that, that determines. I just saw an article that showed that 92% um, of online consumers check product reviews before they buy. Wow. 92%? Guys? We can't wow. get ninety-two percent of people in the world to believe that the Earth is round, you know? <laughs> but but ninety-two percent will pile in to this particular source of information because it's so powerful. Right? That social proof aspect. That social proof comes out. Right. So so in each of those cases, where I I'm going to get screen grabs and show how various. Um, entities within the online communities have used these principles. Yeah. They're not. They're not just from the earlier media that uh, where they work. They they work in each new um, uh, form of uh, communication because they're not about the form of the communication. They're about how we work yeah. as a species how we decide when and what to do. Um, and uh, they ought to be, it's heartening to me, let me say that, that they seem to be as, um, uh, as effective in the new media as they have been in the past. I, I was, yeah. uh, I, I have to say, I, I was um, encouraged by uh recognizing that the in the last edition of influence 2008 there was no internet yeah to wow. speak of right right now the book is is called the bible of online marketing <laughs> <They're>, <laughs> So well, it couldn't be the medium. It couldn't be the platforms. It had to be the psychological tendencies that right. the book talks about. Yeah, I was. I, I booked some airline tickets this morning on Orbitz, and they yeah. always come. We, you're, you're checking, and there are only three left yeah. at this price. Yeah. You know, scarcity oh, right yeah. there. Man, you got and it puts it puts a fire under me when I see that. Yeah, yeah. it's it's really. I mean, and, and to to do that now. I know you were also talking about wanting to get readers' reports, and so yeah. can you tell our listeners what readers' reports are and how they might be able to potentially help you out in, in your endeavor. Yes. And um, make people famous if they, uh, <laughs> because there you go. Famous is good. Yeah. Um, like famous. A few editions ago, I started a, a feature in the book influence called readers reports in which I invited readers of the book to send to me reports of how they have seen any of the principles working on them or for them successfully right? stories they they could tell right and um 
and then summarize that experience for me, send it in, and if it fit with um, the, the text material, I would add it as a box, uh, a, a separate feature called reader's reports, and I would describe who this person was, at this person's role, and then in the front, I would acknowledge this person yeah. as having contributed uh, the, the, to the book. Uh, and so uh, I'm, I want to do that now for the new edition of Influence. As many uh, examples that people have in their own experience of having confronted, encountered, or employed one or another of these principles in a way that uh, made a difference, I yeah. would love to hear about it because I know my other readers would love to hear about stories from people just like them. Yeah. Well, our, I mean, Behavioral Grooves is about the about the application of behavior science to life and work. And so our listeners, that's what we we talk about here. So how do you apply that? So hopefully they will have some great insights for you. And, and we will put in the show notes, uh, the website where that goes, info at influence at work.com is right. uh, the website to, to, to put those in. To email. send those uh, re readers reports, yes. Info yeah, and, at influence at work.com. Right. Yeah. yeah, and so we'll we'll put that in the show notes and different things. And we encourage people to do that because yeah. that would be great. And so, Bob, one of the things that we always do on Behavior Grooves, and this is Tim's thing, not mine, so I will blame him if, if you are uh, there, but we always end up with a uh, uh, talk about music. And so, Tim, do you have a music question? This is how we end our show. I, I, I do. I mean, you, you've lived in a lot of places. You've traveled uh, extensively, Bob. Are, are there... Uh, uh, and you've you've also spoken a lot about priming, right? You've done a lot of work on on priming, right. and I'm just wondering, have you ever used music uh, for priming in advance of of some uh, experience yeah. or a talk or a romantic dinner or yeah. anything like that? Uh, so I I do speak uh, uh, in in uh, conferences and conf uh, conventions, and very often they bring you onto the stage with a piece of music as you come on, right? They call it a stinger, by the way, just for those really? who are not in the industry. They call it a stinger. Yeah. yeah. And they always would have some sort of high energy, upbeat music, you know, pounding beat and, and a lot of energy associated as I came on. Well, the truth is, that's fine if you are a motivational speaker. If what you <laughs> want to do is stir people into action, but it turns out that that stirring into action lasts for about four minutes after you've left the room. It's not something that I think is lasting. It's a temporary emotional state that you produce. I'm not an emotional, I'm not a, a motivational speaker. I'm an educational speaker. Mm. I don't want people ramped up with their emotions overcoming their cognitions. I want them thinking. I want them in a state of mind that's that's conducive to thinking about what I have to say. Because if they process that, that lasts much longer than four minutes, right? So I don't want them to play songs with that upbeat. I want them to play a Bob Dylan song. Or I want them to play the Aretha Franklin song, Think. Yes. Uh, yes. yes. Think. That's where I want. So that is a prime. Yeah. It's a state of mind I want to put them in before I ask them to process my material. Well, fantastic. So love that. It, love that. Bob, thank you so much. This has been a, a pleasure. It has been insightful, and we really do appreciate your time and your insights. Well, uh, let me just say something that I appreciate uh, about what you guys are doing. And that is this emphasis on the application of what we've learned uh, in the behavioral sciences. Uh, for so many years, uh, academics uh, weren't willing to speak 
to the larger community mm. about their work. We only talk to one another in our journals, the journals that no one read except ourselves. And, and so the work that could benefit people enhance their outcomes was essentially uh, underground. Um, and I think I know why. There is a, a, a British a legal scholar uh, named John Boyle who said, you have never heard true condescension until you've heard an academic, right, describe the word popularizer <laughs> wow wow and that's what we were afraid of yeah for a long time it's right? the rock band selling out right it's, it's the you, selling out yeah right so i was worried when i first wrote influence in a conversational tone uh, with a mm -hmm. conversational style and for a popular audience that I would receive that kind of um, uh, disapprobation. I, I would be negatively uh, evaluated by my colleagues, right? Uh -huh. uh, but I decided to do it anyway because it seemed to me that we owed it to the larger community yeah. to tell them about our research because they had paid for it yeah. in any meaningful sense. They had paid for that work with their taxes, with their contributions to universities. They were entitled to know what we had found with their money. Right? So I did it anyway. Yeah. And fortunately, I didn't get that pushback. And I think that's true for two reasons. One is it was hard to call influence a pop psychology book because there were hundreds of references oh, yeah. citations to science to yeah. bolster my conclusion that's one of the things right the other was one i didn't recognize at the time uh, but now i think is also a major competitor and that is i wasn't talking about i wasn't trying to elevate my own research or any segment of uh, research studies. I was trying to elevate an approach to knowledge, and that is behavioral science. Right? Yeah. So I think that's why my contemporaries, fellow behavioral scientists, didn't have a hard time with influence uh, because of an adage I, uh, I, I believe in deeply, and that is people don't sink the boats they're riding in, right? Ah, mm -hmm. And I put them in the boat that was ah. being launched with influence of, pay attention to behavioral scientists. They yeah. know something it's been under the surface so far, but they know something that will improve uh, how you understand the world and also how you operate in it. And so, I, I, listen, I appreciate what you guys are doing uh, on well, that dimension. Well, thank you for that. We appreciate uh, all the work that you've done. I just want to, my favorite part of Presuasion, we didn't talk about Presuasion no, at all. but loved it. But uh, a great, it. great yeah. book, but was at the end where you brought all the research and you, you had a whole separate book chapter yeah. of, of, of just talking about the different research studies that you were using in there. Right. Um, and so and if more, anybody- more than just little citations, more than just a bibliography. Yeah, you 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 went off and you expanded upon that. that and that was fantastic. So yeah, we loved thank it. you for your work and uh, uh, thank you for being on the show. Well. Kurt, Tim, I enjoyed uh, it very, uh, very deeply. Welcome to our grooving session, where Tim and I groove on what we learned from our behavior groups interview, have a free-flowing discussion on some of those topics, and whatever else comes into our pre-fluenced and primed brains. Did you say prime? I did. 
I always say prime. I don't know. It's, it, I guess I'm primed to say prime. It ah, works. Yeah, there you go. So, Tim, I know we want to uh, talk a little bit about what we learned in there, but I think we want to clarify one component of, of one of the studies that Bob brought up. Exactly, Kurt. So we want to clarify that uh, regarding the littering and political voting study that Bob talked about very early in the discussion, uh, what the results of the study were is that, that people – uh, in, in the parking lot, threw away the, um, the flyers of the party that they didn't like, and they tended to keep the flyers of the party that they did like. Which seems, uh, you know, intuitive, right? That's, exactly. That, that is there. And so when exactly. we looked, you looked at the ground to see which candidate had um, or party had more on the ground, and they were more likely going to be the uh Losing. The losing candidate. Yes, exactly. So, so, uh, so, and we'll have that. We'll have, post a link to the original study in the show notes. Sa- sounds fantastic. So, beyond that, what were some of the interesting things for you? Well, I, there were. I, I had a few, but you had a lot. I did have a lot. <laughs> was, I was, have talked I about was this. super excited about going deep on this. But so, actually, let's start with you, Kurt. Okay, because if if we have time, we'll get to my stuff. <laughs> oh, well, thank you, Tim. <laughs> That's the first time you've ever been nice to me. <laughs> so just I, don't take it for granted. <laughs> so he talked about we, we talked about egoism, right? And and that concept of egoism driving our helping others in need. And I wanted to to talk about that and bringing that back into this concept of self, this self identity, our self schemas, because I think there's this overlap on that, and I think it's really interesting. And again, he was talking about you know egoism. People help not simply to advance the well being others, but that they want to feel good. They want to feel good about themselves. Yeah, and this gets yeah. back into that reinforcing of our self concept. So. We have an idea about the type of person that we are or that we want to be, that we desire to be. Right. It could be a future state. It could definitely be a future state. Mm -hmm. And our actions don't always mirror that component. And so where he was going, I think, with this egoism component is not only that it makes us feel good, but it makes us feel more in line with that desired state of who we want to be, that self-concept or the desired self-concept. And that can be a really powerful motivator. So that part was really fascinating to me. Um, well, I don't know. And, and this is a self-alignment thing. This, is, this, is, this does connect to the self-alignment, self-identity uh, aspect in, insofar as it, it feels good. And that says, and as soon as it feels good, it's like, well, this is who I am. Right. And, and so it's this reinforcing, right? This is this reinforcement loop that goes on about our self behavior, our self concept. Yeah. So we do behaviors and we, we see ourselves doing those behaviors and that should align with our self concept. If it doesn't, it either does a couple things. And we talked about this in a, in a previous grooving session that we did on self-concept. So if people want to get a deeper insight, they can listen to that. But it really, it either reinforces that or it, or it kind of uh, makes us aware that maybe that self-concept is not right. And we can often either ignore that, uh, and, and we often, often ignore that feedback that we get. But what we're saying here is this is actually one of those opportunities that usually uh, reinforces that positive concept of who we are because that altruism is a positive respect for most people. And so we're doing it even if nobody else ever finds out about it. It's reinforcing our own self-concept. Yeah. And at the same time, context still matters. Yes. The, the environment in which that 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 helping opportunity you know, uh, arises makes a big difference. And this goes back to the, uh, the Darley and Batson study from 1973 on, uh, the Jerusalem to J- J- uh, Jericho, the, uh, the good Samaritan kind right. of model, right. Where they, where they had, uh, I think they were seminary students. They were seminary students. Yeah. <laughs> that were, that were put in a situation where, uh, when they had enough time, they were extremely helpful. Right. But, but when they didn't have enough time, they were less than helpful. And so, you know, the the funny part about that is they were they were seminary going to students. give a, well, they were seminary students going to give a, a a speech or their their sermon 
on the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan. <laughs> right. And yet they right. pass right by if they're they're in a rush. And, yeah. and so yeah, context does matter. And I loved the study that he talked about in regards to that Bob talked about. Uh, you know, regarding the jerseys that they're wearing. <laughs> yeah, because you're never wearing your uh, your Green Bay Packers uh, jersey on a day when you might get into an accident in Minnesota, <laughs> right? Well, I mean, <laughs> not that I wear my Green Bay Packers jersey or, or a Viking jersey, but I do wear my Timberwolves, you know, information or clothing quite often. Yeah. But I think it's fascinating when, you know, obviously it makes sense, right? They're wearing the, the jersey or something, so... Uh, that of your team and so you feel this connection with them right at the beginning like when you said they're like me they're part of my tribe so so yes i'm going to feel uh more likely to help them so how can we raise that that one of the questions that that we talked about was how can we elevate that identity how can we how can we have a bigger umbrella around who we're connecting with well and bob brought that up in the just the generic soccer jersey that they were wearing again more likely people were more likely to help that person and so i think you can take this concept and and use it in a number of different applications so applying this to work and to life right so if we think about this in politics this is obviously i think a a major area here but we often get you know riled into party identities. And instead of party identities, can we elevate the conversation up to country, um, Mm -hmm. up into the types of behaviors, the outcomes that we want to have for um, our children? Because again, we have had this conversation, 90% of the beliefs, I think, on both sides, I don't have any empirical evidence to, to prove this, but you know what? Everybody wants to have a positive economic environment. They want to have a good, safe life for themselves and for their kids. They want a good social structure they too, want, su- for, as a support. Yeah. yeah, they want to be healthy. They want to have all of these things. And those are all commonalities. Those are all the soccer jersey, right? Not the specific soccer team, but the soccer jersey. And so right. the more that we can elevate those conversations up to that higher level, I think that can help. Now, well, I, 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 go I gotta ahead. say that, you know, Lily, Liliana Mason from the University of Maryland has researched this and finds that, that people are less likely to go for the greater good, to support the greater good, as you just pointed out, that we, again, we think that that would be altruistic and, and important when the party politics get in the way, when the party politics is is um, is, is saying, no, actually, you don't have to worry about the greater good because because we've got something that's more important. Uh, people tend to follow that so that somehow the identity moves away from soccer and moves to the team. So it brings it, it down. It brings it down as opposed to elevating it. It brings it down uh, in, in a really typically a negative way. Right. And th- that is the hard part that needs to be overcome. Right. Yeah. And so how do you overcome that? And one of the ways, again, uh, this comes not from our conversation with Bob in the podcast, but we saw Bob speak at a, at a conference. And in that conference, one of the things that he talked about was, again, trying to how do you change somebody's political view or even just change their, oh, their yeah. component? He had a great example. Right. And he said, so you have to, you know, you, you, truthfully, as much as you can, you know, say or show how you might have been like them, right? So that you were part of their tribe, but then you had this insight. And so, but the fact that you were in their tribe. So I, you know, I used, I was like you, I believed X. Yeah. I believed it strongly, you know, but now, now I believe Y. And, and, and just in that component of saying, I was like you, it, it opens up the defense that the people have and they go, oh, okay. Um, and, and so now you can actually have a, hopefully a, a real conversation on that as opposed to the immediate defenses going up. Now, how well that works and how easily it's done is you know, still hard. And I don't think everybody is going to do it uh, and be open. 
Yeah, I mean, we still have this issue of uh, if if I don't agree with your political beliefs, am I going to trust that your salmon recipe is any good? Going back to our interview with Annie Duke, it, it's it's brutally difficult to it, to overcome that. But if we can if we can start that conversation yes. by pointing to our similarities and and pointing to the component and getting people to identify that yes, we're part of this same tribe then I think we have a better chance. Not saying that we're always going to get there, even most of the time we're going to get in there. But we have a better chance of having a real conversation and potentially uh, influencing that other person uh, in their beliefs and various yeah. different things. Yeah. I think the, the the third thing, so that's politics. Those are, those are a couple po- political things. But think about this also from a leadership perspective. And this... As opposed to elevating things, we like, might like, need, like a corporate leadership, a world. corporate leadership, yeah, the, corporate leadership, community leadership, whatever that would be. Are are you a leader that is building an organization that is tribe worthy? Right. right. So, right. Uh, is, is your company, your division, your team, it, is it a tribe? Are are you creating components of that that make it feel like something I want to be part of, that I identify that part of who I am resonates with that team, that division, that company. And I think, you know, you can do a lot in order to to help that. In other words, most people aren't going to be uh, joined to a tribe because of the financial components of not if, if that's the only piece right. of it. Not enough. No. You need to have emotional elements. You need to have pieces of what of a purpose. What is it that you're doing? Why is this tribe, what is the community within this tribe? Yeah. What are those aspects that really help in making this beyond I'm going to work for a paycheck? Yeah, and that, and that study by... Um I think it was Greg Walton uh, in, uh, just in 2012 uh, talked about how it doesn't take much actually to get it up to elevate the story uh, and, and a corporate setting is a good example of that. You can you can become tribe worthy not with very little effort but 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 by just having something. No, but that w- that was the 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 research where they looked at um, having these college students come in and read this article and the author, they had pre had it where his birth date was listed on there and they, (laughs) they matched the birth date to people or they put the birth date like months, uh, years away. And the fact that if you just had the same birth date, you, that was enough to align you at a higher level, align you at a higher level with what the content of that information was fascinating, fascinating study to that point finding those commonalities, right? And that's a commonality. So again, there's other research out there that looks that, that talks about if somebody has the same first name as you, if somebody has the first name that starts with the same letter as exactly. your first name. Again, it, can be, it doesn't the, take a lot. They're very little pieces, but it's important to think about, and, and, and not saying change your name in order to get people to like you. No, no, no. That, I think what that is what you're saying. Everybody in a whole corp company should, <laughs> should all have the same first name. I should so. just hire Kurtz, right? Is that <laughs> right. what I should do? More Kurtz. Or everybody that starts with K, you know, oh, they, Kurt and Karen. And, well, that's you like know, those families. Karina that have... and Kovacek <laughs> and, you know, yes. <laughs> there we go. You know, and, it, you know, uh, it goes back into the sense of belonging, right? You know, Roy Baumeister, Baumeister, I can never pronounce his last name, right? Talks about this human need to belong. Oh, yeah. Goes back, you know, you can go into to Maslow's hierarchy of needs and belonging is on that, you know, one of the lower rungs of the of the triangle. So Fundamental. Absolutely yeah. fundamental to who we are. Yeah. Okay. So um, that, was, that was your first thing. Now... Now that we've talked about you, let's talk more about you. What is your second thing? <laughs> <laughs> this isn't about me. This is about oh, Bob's work and, it is. and how fascinating it is. It well, is. And we had so many notes on it. It was pretty. It was pretty terrific. I, I did. Yeah. I I, you know. I had a lot. So well, so, okay. How about you? you we, in, when we were talking about this, you talked about uh, Teresa Mobley and uh, Steve Kramer's work in uh, the Progress Principles, right? And, and, and so he talked about. I mean, that new research that he's doing about social proof, right? Yeah. That, 
that if you don't have that social proof, that if you point to the trend, that is maybe not quite as equivalent, but is really good at getting to, to influence people around your thing. So again, pointing to those three marks and saying, hey, we were here, then we were here, and now look at us, we're here. Right. And and it brought up that progress principle by by Amelie, and she did some really interesting research. So the oh, progress principle, such cool stuff, right? Yeah. It was this. Uh, they did uh, these diary research, and so they have hundreds and hundreds of of diaries, and so they look at these diaries and they they do qualitative analysis of it, where they're looking at what makes a good day for somebody, and that good day basically revolved around they moved forward in what they were trying to do. However little, it didn't have to be much at all. I mean, progress. they had some, it was progress. Yeah. They had a, a, in the book, they talk about Swiffer and the, the people okay. that were designing Swiffer and some things. And just this component of like moving out from one meeting and getting a decision made to move forward with some of their marketing campaign. I'm totally misquoting that. But it was this this element of progress and making just a, a little bit and bad days were those days where you either stagnated or the really bad days where where something went backwards yeah. and again it didn't have to be significantly backwards it was just we didn't come to a decision on that marketing campaign and now we're put back another two weeks before we get to meet again that got to be making the day really bad and i think the, some of those trends in progress are can can be aligned to that. It, it, uh, that also reminds me of sequencing, and I go back to uh, you know one of my heroes, George Lowenstein. George has been studying sequencing since the '90s, um, but he he did a, a study as recently as just a, a year or so ago on uh, banks using rewards to uh, to keep big uh, big deposit big depositors from uh, taking money out of their accounts he right wanted, away. Right. Yeah, right away. Wanted to keep that money. The banks want to keep the money in the in the account as long as possible, right? So so they tested a variety of of, of uh, follow-up communication, sometimes with rewards, sometimes with gifts, um, and the sequence made a big difference in in how people responded and, and the kind of behaviors that they that they acted on. So they had a, a thank you letter. They had, a, they had another a gift. letter with a gift, and then they had a different kind of uh, information uh, letter or it, something like that. Exactly. There were different lengths and different different formats that they tested, uh, and uh, and all of them had different outcomes. You know, so it wasn't like this. Oh, just always do this one thing. Uh, but it was in certain circumstances there is a sequence that is more favorable to reaching the outcome that you want, you know, better than others. Yeah. Uh, so progress is something that we can have some blips along the way, but if we continue to see some kind of modest, steady progress, we're much happier, right? Our experiential, our memory world gets uh, much richer in, in how we view ourselves. Well, and uh, to that point, I think that's that peak end rule too coming into play here a little <laughs> bit, right? Yeah, there it is. Because yeah. now your your end, and we're talking about the whole, you know, my football team comes back from, you know, being behind and wins versus my football team is way up and then you know they they just and the barely, score doesn't change they and then, barely squeak it out it's a it's yeah. a different end um or at least the process up to the end and so i think that trend component is really fascinating to me because uh, i think it has a lot of uh, parlance into a lot of other factors right and people can use that idea of hey showing the trend can really influence how people are perceiving something, even if it's, hey, it's not going to be a big social proof because we got 2% of the market share. But wow, you know, a year ago, we were at 0.5% of the market share mm -hmm. um, and showing that trend in, in different things. So one more thing for me. Does it have to do with priming? How did you guess? <laughs> Oh, I, I, or should I just say socks? <laughs> <laughs> no. So here, there, there's, there's a couple of things. So he talked about music as a prime. Yes. Think. Oh, it, so so we're not talking about priming. We're talking about music. We're talking about music <laughs> as a prime. And and my question to you is: Do you think that music is a powerful prime? Is it more powerful than say socks? 
huge. Oh, <laughs> it took me a minute to actually weight the, the lack of gravity in that question. <laughs> yes. Hell yes. So, uh, what, so what makes music such a, a good prime? What, what do you think does that? Well, I go back to Dan Levitt, Levitin's uh, book on um, uh, this is your this is your brain on music. Okay, which is a which is a terrific treatise on all the neuropsychology that goes along with music. But you know, the the, the bottom the, the simple answer is why do we listen to uh, to Semisonic's closing time at the end of the night? It's not just because it says closing time. It actually the the vibe of the song is. Now what? Yeah. Now what? This is this really the end? Is this all there is? The whole feeling of the song, the chords, the melodies, and the words set up this whole. Oh man, is this really the end? It was either a great night or it wasn't a great night, but this is the end of the night. Yeah. Um, and that makes a difference. Or when we listen to uh, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, you know, I, you know, you hear those opening chords. Uh, you just you have to have an, uh, an emotional reaction to that, yeah. you, you know, and there's no words that go along with it, but there's like, bam, you just get hit with it. So there's something in our, in our neuroscience in, in the way that our brain processes music. That's that, huge. That gets yeah. at a potentially a different level. Now I don't have any empirical evidence on this or data and, and research, but I, I think, I think there's something there. I think that music um, does have this, power, right? You listen, you hear a song, you haven't heard a song in 30 years, 20 years, 10 years for all our younger listeners, right? A year. A year. (laughs) You haven't heard a song in a year and you hear it on the radio and and what happens? It cues up your brain in this happy moment. You get this little dopamine spurt that says, oh, that's good. Well, and and, and it takes you, sometimes it takes you back into that time period. You know, I hear something from my high school days. Not always, but oftentimes I hear something and and it brings back, it primes those memories, Mm -hmm. those associations that I have. They're linked. From when I was in high school. Or from when I was in college, I remember the first time, you know, I heard Nine Inch Nails and I can, I can tell you I got the, the, the cassette, you know, because that's what you bought back then, put it in and, and I listened to it in my apartment in Iowa City, Iowa, um, and it was just, you know, mesmerizing for me. We'll, and I, we'll, and have I hear... a, we'll have a link to a musical cassette in the show <laughs> notes for people who aren't sure what that is. Yeah, and... But it it takes you back to those things. So I think there is something about music acting as a prime that can be more powerful than maybe even socks. Wow, that's a lot coming from you. But I, Cialdini obviously thinks it's important because he likes to be queued up on stage with the music with uh, Aretha Franklin's "Think." Yeah, yeah. And so again, it, and and that is also he talked, and I thought was really you know insightful is the music tone and the quality of the song and and is it a motivational pump you up and then if he isn't a motivational pe- person to build off of that energy and and kind of excitement within that uh the crowd right then that works as a negative prime then it all of a sudden it's like this fall down and you're going oh i was all pumped and now it's like oh this is, uh. so i think that was really insightful of him Absolutely. So I have one last question on primes. And and this one, again, I, I, I just trying to think about this is, you know, I use primes um, on myself, right? I, I, I wear my socks. We've talked about that numerous mm-hmm. times. People are sick of hearing about my socks. And, and uh, I, want, I want to come back to that in just a second, but go ahead. But, you know, but Cialdini uses think um, to go there. And we've talked with other people who have used music or other things to prime them in certain things versus those primes that are unintentional or subliminal or are done to us that we're not necessarily aware of. Do you think self primes are more or less powerful than those other types of primes? That's a really, really good question, Kurt. I, um, one would think that if we've gone through the process of, considering what would prime us, that that's a reflective, you mm-hmm. know, action, right? And that, um, that if we've decided that this, this pair of socks 
is with the narwhals and the unicorns is going to prime us in a particular way that when we put them on, there would likely be um, uh, an exponential factor of priming in that, oh, I'm putting these on because I want this to happen. Because they're aligning with our goal motivation, right? And so we are trying to achieve something with them, which is tapping into this goal that we have. Uh, and so that alignment around that, in addition to the subtle or prime component and of it's, it. It's not likely that we're not going to go there, right? It's it's unlikely that if we've decided that the narwhal and unicorn socks are going to prime us for magical thinking, that when we put them on, we'll say, well, I don't feel like being magical today. Yeah. That, that's pretty unlikely, isn't it? Or or when I, you know, the, the, the reason I like socks is it's those moments of unexpected seeing them when you sit down in a chair and you you know, cross your leg and all of a sudden you catch the sock out of the corner of your eye and you go, ah, yeah, that's where it is. I think <laughs> at those moments, that's where uh, it really can impact and, and have that, again, more on a subliminal, it's less conscious than, and when you put your, so it, when I put my socks on, it's a very conscious component. Um, but those, those moments when they unexpectedly show up yeah, are the parts yeah. where I think, maybe that self-prime actually is a reinforcement because you know in the conscious component of putting them on, you know what that subconscious prime is going to be in those little snippets. So so we, uh, you and I were in San Francisco a few months ago at a, at a conference and uh, we happened to be going through a, a touristy area uh, where they had a, sh a sock, you know, a sock vent, shop, a sock shop. And, uh, I thought, all right, I'm just gonna, I'm going to give this a try. I'm going to give this whole. Of course, I actually own. I have socks that you've given me yes. <laughs> to prime me, <laughs> which are, are are very nice. But I thought I'm going to I'm going to go to the next level. I'm going to invest in my own, and so I bought several pair of socks that I thought would help prime me. And I was recently with a client. I crossed my legs, and the client said, "Oh, nice socks." <laughs> and, oh, yes. Yeah. So I got to tell the story, which had that actually that little hit of dopamine you know yeah. it just was like oh it's working yeah well and then you're getting social reinforcement oh right? yeah so yeah. there you so go it's the double the yeah. double hit yeah, yeah. very um, interesting yeah all right so so we've exhausted my line of inquiry here what do you what did you take out of this beyond what we've already talked about think think <laughs> aretha aretha the queen of soul yeah. Yeah. No. I, I, I. Everything that you said. You know. I mean. Everything that we've already talked about was just so great, and it was a wonderful. God, just the. You know, um, thinking about how we me re remember things, right? And how I go back to that conversation. I remember these these beautiful generalities about how much fun it was just to to talk with Bob and how generous of a guest he was. Yeah. Um, but I re really did. I really appreciate the fact that. He thinks about priming in such a way that he chooses think to be the the, the little stinger that opens him up when he walks on stage at, at whatever conference. Um, that was that was pretty darn cool as far as I was concerned. Yeah, that got my musical quota just right up there. <laughs> so, and it got me thinking about it too. Yeah, yeah. Well, good. What would be your walk on music? Oh man. I wasn't expecting that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Not. <laughs> what would be my walk on music? Well, it would depend on the event. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so when I when I play when I'm performing as a musician and I'm playing gigs um, where I'm choosing the the music in advance, the the playlist is highly curated for me, and I'm using um, I I use music that influenced me. So okay. I'm using blues and jazz and folk and and uh, you know country rock uh, songs that influenced me, so that it lays this foundation to the people who are going to be listening to me in 20 minutes. What you know, that's kind of where I'm coming from. So um, that that would include Crosby, Stills and Nash, and Dan Fogelberg, and and uh, Paul Simon, and you know, it might be. Who, who knows? Old you know? people. Oh, <laughs> yes, yes. But they're they're the predecessors to they're they're what influenced me. Um, but if you and I were going on to give uh, a, a, a talk, yeah, 
I don't, I'm not sure, but I would want it to, I would want to select that very carefully. And of course the default would be think right now, <laughs> but uh, that's because it's just, it's val- primed. It's primed right now it's, and it's available. It's easy. Yeah. Right. So, uh, but I'd, I'd have to put some system two thinking into that. Okay. So how about you? Do you, th- you have something that I, comes I, to mind? You know, I, I don't have a specific song. I have a genre. So unlike Bob, I I don't consider myself a motivational speaker. I consider myself more of a uh, educational speaker, like he does, right? Yeah. So when I'm up there, I'm not the rah rah guy. Um, I do bring some energy, I think. Very but, much so. But my musical taste might be a little different because I would actually go with again going back into that timeline of of different pieces. I would go back into some power riff kind of new new wave slash almost industrial kind of something that is off kilter for most people. And oh. and I mean off kilter oh. from the perspective that not not the popular song, right? So it would be a song that would be It wouldn't have under, been a top forty tune. Under the radar. Oh, interesting. Um and from that perspective, uh, you know, and again, for me, thinking through that, it is the, the, the component that hopefully what I'm presenting to them is going to be different. And so that yeah. they're, they're going, oh, what is this? This is different. I haven't heard this before. Um, and so that would then parlay itself back into the, the speech that I would be or the presentation or the talk. Well, there's a lot of continuity in that to say, I'm not going to serve up the top 10 hits no. to you. I'm not, a, I'm not the top 10 hits guy. I'm going to serve up the, the B side. I'm going to serve up the, the tunes that were deep tracks on the record, right? Deep tracks. That's yeah. it. There yeah. You go. So you're a deep tracks guy. Yeah. I dig that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do have to say that this was an absolute privilege of having a conversation with Bob Cialdini and just the insights as everybody's listening and we're going on and on and on. Uh, I think we're really impactful and, and we could, we could have, we could groove on this for another hour. Absolutely. Uh, but I don't think people are going to listen for another I'm, I'm hour of pretty us. pretty damn sure of that. So yeah. I think it's time for us to wrap up. What do you think? I think it is. And uh, so let's uh, thank uh, CGI for uh, sponsoring us. Yes, uh, in, thank in, you, CGI. In this, in this episode. Uh, thank our listeners. Thank for... our listeners. Thank Bobette, who uh, works with, with Bob, who helped in setting up the appointment and everything. So thank you, Bobette. Bob, Bobette Gordon was absolutely instrumental in making this happen. Yeah. Uh, without her effort, uh, w- th- this this wouldn't have come to come to pass. So, so. thank her and yeah. thank Bob. He was gracious with his time, and we had some technical f- kind of things oh, up yes. front that yes. he just rolled with it and, and was wonderful. So thank you for that. And yeah, that thank was. you, listeners. And if you like this, please go out, give us a review. We ask it all the time, uh, and I just it really does make a difference. And not only does it make a difference uh, with the podcatchers and people trying to find us, but it makes a difference with, with Tim and me. We actually read those reviews and there is this component of we will answer you. We will we will say thank you or if you have a, you know, say something, we'll, we'll expand upon it. So, um, and we like hearing from you. So please do that. And uh, with that, keep, keep on grooving. grooving.